Good morning, Lion Hearts. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. And I am at my grandpa's house. I always stay with my grandpa. And, uh, <laughs> hilarious. I came in late last night. Seth brought me down here to, uh, to stay. And my grandpa has a couple of rooms. So, since Seth stays, lives about two and a half hours away, he decided to, uh, to stay in one of the rooms. Well, my grandpa woke up and came out to go to the bathroom. And so he got to see us when we came in and I looked down because my grandpa had sent me an email and said, does Ja, that guy, need any food? So I said, yes, he does. So my grandpa went and got him food. And when I walked in and looked, my grandpa is using a pie dish, a, a pie crust with the plastic wrapping still on it for Jaws food bowl. I told you that my grandpa was quite a character, so. And then a bread loaf dish for the water bowl. Gotta love it. And this was my beloved grandmother. We all loved her to death. She was definitely probably the most selfless person I've ever met. Everything she did was for her family. And we lost her to leukemia a few years ago. Well, time for breakfast. Well, look who made it to Ohio and look who made it to Papaw's house. You missed Papaw, didn't you? Well, Seth put the coffee on, so I came to grab a mug and I my eyes about popped out of my head. Look how awesome these old coffee mugs are that my grandpa has. Has this old San Francisco hate Ashbury. I can't imagine where he got that one. Then this one is a, it's a Campbell's Soup commemorative one and it's from 1910, <laughs> or commemorative 1910 cup. And then that, that's just old school 60s. I think I'm gonna go with that one. I really like this one. I can't believe he had these gems up in the closet all these years and I've never known about them. There's my grandpa, and he just talked me into cooking up some hands, ham steak for Seth and I, so we're having ham steak and eggs. Listening to Johnny Cash. Is it safe to say you turned your tablet into uh, being able to read books on your TV? It mirrors them from that onto that. Yeah. My chair, yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. You can read your book from across the room. So I asked my grandpa to turn his Christmas lights on and he, I, I think he's got a new roommate named Hey Google because everything in his house he can say Hey Google and it'll turn on the TV, it'll turn on the Christmas lights, turns on everything. Doesn't that look nice? Well I haven't been able to get my rental car yet so my grandpa was nice enough to take me out to go do the vlog for now and uh, there's something I've known about for quite a while, I hope it's still out here, I think you guys will love it. Right out in the middle of nowhere there is a tribute to the Andy Griffith Show. Well, it has definitely changed over time, but I'm gonna tell you why we came out here. My grandpa actually on our way out here, he told me, he said, you're gonna be kind of disappointed because he said they really let it go. But what used to be here was this guy used to have an identical replica on his property of the Wally service station from the Andy Griffith Show. Now what was interesting about that was every year when I was growing up for, I want to say 10 years at least, he would have a big event out here called the Mayberry Squad Car Rendezvous. And it was a big weekend festival celebrating the Andy Griffith Show and every year he would bring out somebody who had been on the show, made a guest appearance. One year you might get Goober, one year you might get Gomer. One year I do remember Don Knotts, I remember Andy himself. I don't think they ever got Ron Howard, but they had people like James Best, I think. Who else? I can't recall, but this was when I was growing up in the 90s, so. But yeah, it was kind of depressing because he used to literally have an identical, I mean identical Wally service station out here. Maybe we can find some answers. My grandpa actually knows this guy, so we might be able to find out what happened to it. Well, nobody's home, so we really couldn't find out, the but my grandpa's... license plate on that truck. Oh, yeah. 1951. My grandpa said, he said, yeah, it's definitely the same place. He said that, that right there he used to have set up like Andy's office and had the jail and everything in there, but yeah, they've, they've let it go over the years, unfortunately. Well, don't worry guys, I have a few more things to vlog up my sleeve. He's got statues and stuff all over the place, old roadside signs, so my grandpa was saying, he goes, yeah, it's basically like a junkyard now, but he pointed over here and he said, you see he's got cannonballs over there under his tree? Doesn't have a cannon, I don't think, but uh, 
I see a bunch of cannonballs. Let's go take a look at them. You gotta love Ohio. You gotta love Ohio. <laughs> Well, they do actually have a cannon right here on the the front step, so we stand corrected. Look at that. <laughs> well, I guess we're going to get out of here. That's too bad. I was really hoping to show you guys. I didn't realize that uh, the filling station was no longer here, but I'll find some old photos to match up of the old Mayberry Squad Car Rendezvous events, and I'll show you a few of them. Well, if you've ever wondered where my curiosity and my love and fascination for cemeteries began, it was right here. My grandfather used to take periodic walks to this cemetery just about every day, sometimes two, three times a day. And he would walk me through this cemetery and he would point to this guy and to that girl and he'd say, I went to school with her or this guy was in the Civil War or this person was involved in the bank robbery in the town, or he just had a story for everything. And so this is one of those cemeteries that's always made me curious about everybody that was there. And now it's kind of sad because I actually know people that are buried here. Right here is actually my grandmother, who I just love to death. I um, She was just the absolute sweetest person of all time. And this is also where my grandfather will someday be buried. And you can tell how well he keeps it clean. He keeps it all looking nice. He actually has three plots here, and they used to give him grief about having his shepherd's hook here and various things, saying that it was too cluttered up. So he went ahead and took his third spot and put this bench down right here and said, they can't tell me to move it now. And so he's always kept this place looking nice. Every single holiday between him and my mother, they always have wreaths and flowers out here. And you can see that stone that he put there says no longer by my side, but forever in my heart. And if you're wondering why it says near you, that's because that was their wedding song. That's their, that was the song that they was their song. Now this is actually my great-grandmother. My grandmother you guys just saw, this was her mother. And this was the grandma that I told you that we used to call Granny because she was very much like Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. She, <laughs> very much so. She was always nice to me. I always liked her a lot. And so we're gonna actually go to the other side of the cemetery now because my dad is also buried here. And then right over here, well, actually right here would be my father's parents. I guess, I mean, I guess you could call them my grandparents, but I wasn't very close to them. We had a, there's a lot of bad feelings in there, but I'll put them on here anyway. And this was my dad. I love my dad to death. He was, we're very similar when, um, Basically, my parents got divorced when I was five, and it was the next year, I remember my dad had me for the weekend, and he was complaining about his leg hurting. And I remember he went to the doctor, and they told him he had a big tumor in his leg, and he ended up going and living in Washington, D.C., or Maryland, for quite a while being treated. Then he came home, and he seemed like he was okay for a while. I feel like it was like a year. I, he died when I was eight, so it's all, you know, this is how I remember it. And he seemed fine, and then all of a sudden, he kind of, out of almost out of nowhere, got brain cancer. And uh, actually, on April 14th, we were supposed to have a surprise 40th birthday party for him, but he was in the hospital for the two weeks leading up to that and he died shortly before he turned 40, unfortunately. So this year when I found tumors in my hand, I immediately said, well, that makes sense because my dad was my age when he found tumors. Luckily mine were malignant, but his unfortunately ended up taking his life. 
But since you'll never get to meet him, this is as close as you'll ever get. Well, that headstone's upside down. You can see it says, died upside down. Here is someone who fought in the Revolutionary War. John Schaefer. You can see a lot of these have little stars. Those are all military service. This one says 1861 to 1865 GAR. Now the reason we're over here looking around is because my grandfather, ever since he started bringing me here, would always bring me by one grave and say, this is Andrew Dye, the oldest man in the cemetery. So now they've replaced his headstone, because you can tell the other one is just so far gone. 1835. Actually you can see on his old headstone right here, you can see it says Andrew Dye, 1776. All right, go let them know you're here. Oh, there they are. My mom's been working on the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes, you have to chill them after you cook them because they, they're basically rolled peanut butter balls. You basically mix like peanut butter, I think powdered sugar, uh, something else. And then you roll them into balls, dip them in melted chocolate, and then you put them on a tray. And we always put them, because it's Ohio, you get such cold weather here that you usually put them out in your garage and they they solidify. Now the hole in the middle is because you stick a toothpick in there to be able to dip them. That's what they are, yum. Woo! And since you guys haven't seen me yet today, I guess you can watch me take a bite. Oh yeah. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go get my rental car and then we're going to, um, I think I'm gonna head off to Dayton, I'm gonna do some vlogging down in Dayton and meet up with my sister. And that is where they hold the Dayton Air Show. Yep. Well now I'm actually at Dayton International Airport. I didn't even fly into here, but in order to rent a car in this area, you have to come all the way down to Dayton International Airport to do it. So that's what we're here for, so that I can do some vlogging today. Well, we are not gonna go with the rental cars. Even though they were gonna give us a rental car for $13 a day for two days, the grand total at every place we looked at was $125. So we decided I'm just gonna borrow my parents' car whenever I need to go vlogging. Well, we're on our way now to what is considered now kind of the bad part of town, but this is a vlog that I decided when I was coming back I was doing first and foremost. Well, we've made it down here to the historical part of Dayton, and I'm gonna show you something I've wanted to vlog for quite a while. Now, a lot of Dayton is actually really beautiful homes. They're old Victorian homes, old late 1800s, early 1900s homes, but the problem is is that the community here has, over the years, especially since I left, drugs have taken over this community. There's a lot of violence, and my mom actually said she was not too thrilled about me coming down here because she said there's a lot of drive-bys that happen, but there's also a lot of beautiful houses and a really important story that happens right around the corner that I'm gonna tell you about. Now, check out that beautiful house. Isn't that great? These are the kind of houses you'll see all over downtown. I mean, these are kind of on the outskirts of Dayton, but beautiful houses. Now, today's vlog is pretty much about one man, but it ties in his family, and he's actually considered the father of Dayton Funk, a man named Roger Troutman. Roger actually sometimes went by the name Roger. He had a band called Roger and the Human Body. He also had a band called, sometimes called Zap, sometimes called Roger and Zap, and sometimes called Zap and Roger. Now even from the time that Roger was a little boy, he showed signs and interests of learning music and actually told his dad when he was a little boy that he wanted a la-di-da, and when his dad said, if you can figure out how to tell me what a la di is, I'll get you one. And it turns out that was a guitar. So a young Roger Troutman actually became a somewhat of a guitar virtuoso as a kid, and actually at the age of 15, he was out performing. And kind of similar to the Jackson family, they saw that he was this really gifted young musician, was getting a little bit of attention, and he actually had some brothers, Lester, Terry, and Larry. Lester, Terry, and Larry all decided to pick up instruments 
one playing drums, one playing keyboard, one playing whatever it was that they needed to fill out that sound. And they're credited as being kind of the, the godfathers of not only Dayton funk, but slap funk. And Roger himself was actually known for using this, what he called the golden throat talk box that he actually created himself. He actually started using it right around the same time that Peter Frampton was making it popular with Frampton Comes Alive and also uh, Joe Walsh. Now when I was a little boy, my mom's favorite song throughout the whole 80s, and she used to play the 45 of it constantly, was Roger's song, I Wanna Be Your Man. Now Roger, his whole sound, to me, how I would describe it is, he always used that golden throat talk box, so, that was kind of his signature sound. Now they t tend to use it quite a bit, but if you know the song California Love by Tupac and Dr. Dre, there's a part in there that you always hear this, California Love. That was Roger Troutman, and Roger Troutman actually recorded that shortly before his untimely death at the age of 46, right on this very spot in 1999. Now at the time that Roger was really taking the music industry by storm, all of Dayton kind of was, because Bootsy had a band here called Bootsy's Rubber Band, Heat Wave was here, uh, the Ohio Players were here, and it was just a great time to be involved in the funk, the funk era, especially if you were here. And they actually called, uh, they actually called Dayton at the time Land of the Funk. Now, Roger was actually a protege of Bootsy's. He would go down to Cincinnati and work with him, and right here is a little bit of a memorial to Roger Troutman. It says, Roger Troutman was an artist, songwriter, producer, and frontman for the world-renowned funk band Zap. And if you notice over here, they actually have a mural to Zap. Now, unfortunately, what happened was in 1999, right on the grounds where we're standing was Roger's recording studio called Roger T Recording, Roger T Studios. They were here recording one night. Roger's older brother, Larry, who was also in the band at times, was also the man who was kind of responsible for the business end of things, managing the money. And the story goes that that night they were recording Roger Basically, they had a blow up between Larry and Roger, and Roger said that basically with this new money coming in from doing California Love and this new start of success that he was having, he didn't want Larry to manage the money anymore. And the story goes that when Roger went to leave the studio, he was walking out the back entrance, Larry pulled out a gun and shot him multiple times in the torso. Larry then walked a few blocks away to where his car was parked, got in his car and committed suicide, killed himself, shot himself. The next morning, the police came. 7.30 in the morning, they found a still alive Roger Troutman laying on the ground, took him to the hospital where he died in surgery. And then they found Larry dead in his car a few blocks away. Now since those days of Roger T, they said the studio was actually in pretty bad shape and at one point had to be torn down. But Dayton being what it was, loving their history of the Wright brothers and anyone that's connected with Dayton, which is one of the things that I love the most about Dayton, they decided to erect this monument. This They call it a statue in honor of Roger. And that it is, and it's very unique in its construction as well as what it actually does. Let's get a little closer and I'll tell you. Now, if we want to read the plaque, I'll finish. It says, Roger played a major role in the Ohio funk movement, heavily influencing West Coast hip hop. Well known for his innovative use of the talk box, a device that created unique vocal effects, Roger scored a bevy of funk and R&B hits throughout the 80s and 90s. The Troutman brothers planted their roots in Dayton. He actually, it doesn't say on here, but he was actually from a kind of an outskirts town called Hamilton, and that's actually where he's buried. Um, and he's actually, his tombstone is shared with his brother Larry, who killed him. Now, 
It says the Trotman brothers planted their roots in Dayton and contributed to the vibrancy of the city. This marks the site of the former Troutman Sound Labs recording studios where Roger, Larry, Lester, and Terry and other musicians produced many gold and platinum sound recordings. Roger is still celebrated by a multitude of friends and fans in Dayton and throughout the world. Roger's musical legacy truly lives on. Now they actually have another plaque over here that mentions that this unique sound sculpture was created for Roger. You see right there. Now what's great about this sound sculpture is that it's actually a timed wind chime. So what that means is that certain times of the day, it's tuned to play Roger's song, I Can Make You Dance. I thought that was great. It actually contains 27 triangles in this design, you can see. And like I said, right here on this spot would have been what they called the Troutman Sound Labs, or some call, it was actually, I think, specifically titled Roger T Enterprises or Roger T Recording. That would have happened right here and he would have been killed right here. Roger always encouraged young people to follow their dreams. His dream was to launch satellites, not rockets, because rockets come down, but satellites stay up. Proud to be a satellite, Shirley Murdoch. Now Roger also actually was, uh, was in a couple of the Parliament Funkadelic records, and George Clinton and Parliament actually discovered them, or kind of discovered them, signed them, put out some of his records before he moved on to Warner Brothers and had the great successful career that Roger and Zapp would have. And like I said, my mom's favorite song when I was growing up was Roger's I Wanna Be Your Man. So if you go and listen to that, I bet you'll see the hooks in there are just absolutely amazing and it's such a catchy, addictive song that everyone I think would love it. Now the police report that I was able to find about the murder actually said that the police actually were called out here because they got a call that a car had crashed on the 2100 block into a tree of uh, Harvard Avenue and that was actually, um, Larry was driving a black Mercedes and shot himself while he was driving and crashed into that tree. Long live Roger Troutman. And one of the oddities after Roger's death was that it wasn't more than three years later, Roger Troutman Jr. would be arrested for murdering someone himself. 46 years old. Just sad. And to Dayton's credit, since I moved away in the recent years, Dayton has actually opened up a Funk Music Hall of Fame. And if I have time while I'm here on this trip, I am gonna go. Now the main reason that I wanted to do this video vlog was I feel like Roger Troutman, outside of Dayton, is almost widely ignored or not given the graces that he deserves or just not even remembered in the way that he should be. So I wanted to make sure that someone covered this in a way that I felt like was honoring to Roger. And like I said, my mom played it constantly when I was a kid. I could probably sing this song by heart. But he was actually murdered the year that I moved away. and. That's just always stuck with me. I just always remember thinking how bizarre that was that you you never, those were the days when people weren't, you didn't hear about the murders in Dayton. Not quite like what you do now. I think it's, for the last 10 years, it's been in the top 10 of murder cities and drug cities even higher. So it's pretty sad what's happened to this area. And uh, to think that a lot of Roger's legacy was right here in this neighborhood. And as we get out of here, check out that cool house. Almost kind of a barn structure. Wow, check out this abandoned high school. Just sitting here to rot. Oh, check out that house. That's great too. I love that. Tudor. Well, there's another abandoned house and you can tell why the whole place caught on fire. Looks like the fact that it was built out of stone and brick saved some of it, but the entire roof is gone. And we're actually right here on the 2100 block of Harvard, where Larry Troutman was found dead. And as I mentioned, the story was that they got a report that a car had hit a tree on this block and that the driver had shot himself. Now, I don't specifically know which tree that it was, 
But this one up here has some damage. And I almost wonder if this was it. I know it wouldn't have been memorialized in any way, but who knows? And if you're wondering, this, uh, this street is about, I'd say, four to five blocks away from where the murder happened. And there you can see all the damage to that house. Even though it's abandoned, I don't want to go in there because this is not the best neighborhood and I'm sure somebody's made it their home by now. I honestly wonder how many people in this neighborhood remember this story happening. I mean, it's been 20 years now, or almost 20 years. And even though they have that park up there, sometimes you wonder how many people actually go up and read those plaques. There's nothing on any of the trees out here to kind of memorialize that. I mean, probably, I can understand why, but I don't know, just a sad moment in history here. Now this is kind of a crazy story, but it's kind of like one of those serendipitous things that I gotta tell you. So when I was in high school, Adam and I got into this band. Adam was already into him, but I got into him big time because of Adam when the band was called Brainiac. And in 1997, the singer of Brainiac, Tim Taylor, ended up dying by um, running into a telephone pole down here in Dayton. So they decided this year they're making a documentary on Tim Taylor's life and the history of Brainiac. So about two weeks ago when I was in Belgium, in New York City, actually I think it was in Brooklyn, specifically they did a tribute show where all the members of Brainiac came back and they did a big concert together. Well, I saw on the Brainiac website yesterday that they have some extra shirts from that event and they're selling them here at the Neon. You had to come today and buy, pay in cash. And I just happened to be down here and I said, you know what, I'm only like two minutes away from the Neon. I'm gonna pop it in and buy one of those shirts. Mainly because I think Tim Taylor was so great that he deserves to be remembered. I loved every album. They were all completely innovative and new. And the fact that this money will go towards um, future Brainiac projects to get his legacy out there, I'm totally in. There they are. Yes. They even have two colors, white and blue. I already have the white and red, so I'll probably get the blue. Yep, that's the back. And that's the front. All right, we got one. I couldn't get the blue one because uh, they didn't have my size. They had only a few in uh, not my size. And plus, the back on that one wasn't quite as cool as the back on this one. I think this house wins the Griswold Award this year. Well, gang, I'm home, and that's it. That's the end of our day.